Welcome to the Key Chapters Podcast on Revelation chapter 21. So welcome to the Key Chapters Daily Podcast. My name is Russ Brewer. We are almost done with our year-long study, just Revelation 21 today and Revelation 22 tomorrow. And then we've gone through the entire Bible together, looking at it through the lenses of the key chapters. And so it's been a great study so far. Hope you've been blessed. I sure have. We have a lot to get to, so let's dive on in. We're nearly at the end of our study in in the book of Revelation. And the hostilities of Revelation 4 to 19, they're complete. The Lord has reigned in the millennial kingdom. All of God's enemies are now banished. And that now just leaves us with the remaining components of God's plans and his covenant with his people to commence and endure now throughout eternity. So we're now coming to Revelation 21. And as we come to this chapter, we need to remember what we've said at the beginning of our study in this book. The book of Revelation contains lots of symbolism. And that doesn't mean we can just have a symbolism free for all. We have to ground our interpretation of this book in the concept of finalization. That Revelation, the book of Revelation, is finalizing all of the hopes and all of the expectations of the Old New Testament in the person and in the plan of Jesus Christ. And so when we're reading the book of Revelation and we come across something that's hard to understand, maybe even symbolic, we need to go back to the Old Testament and see if the Old Testament has already laid a principle or established an expectation that would naturally need to be finalized here in this book that covers just the end times as we then enter into this new paradigm of future existence. As we're reading Revelation 21, we're going to find it's full of lots of symbolism, but we're also going to see that these symbols are clearly rooted in the Old Testament scriptures. So starting in verse 1, Verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And so, what's John seeing now? He is seeing this new heaven and this new earth. God has done away with the old heavens and the old earth because they were corrupted. He has now created this new existence for his people to dwell with him without sin. Now, let's ask the question, is there any other place in the Old Testament that talks about the new heavens and the new earth? Well, why, yes, there is. For instance, you'll remember from our study in the book of Isaiah, starting even back in chapter 2, that Isaiah gave the people of God an expectation of this coming new kingdom that would not have any rebellious or wayward people in it. And throughout the book of Isaiah, Isaiah lays out who will be in this kingdom and, and who their king will be and what this kingdom will be like. And then at the end of Isaiah, in Isaiah 65, verses 17 and 19, this is what it says. It says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people, and there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. And so Isaiah has told us that a new kingdom was coming with a new king. These expectations are then being brought to fulfillment throughout the book of Revelation, and now here in Revelation 21, John is showing us the finalization of this expectation. John also tells us in verse 1, there's going to be no more sea. Now, what does he mean by this? Well, once again, we need to go back to the Old Testament, just try to get a sense of of what was the Jewish understanding of of the sea. If we look up the word sea in a concordance, we're going to find 400, a little bit over 400 occurrences of the word sea. Sometimes it's related to things besides the ocean or besides water. But for the most part, you quickly start to see a trend with this word sea. It's used as, as, as boundaries. It's used to describe like the Red Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. But also when it's actually being used, like there's an event going on and the word sea is included, you've got some bad stuff happening. Like Pharaoh and his troops are killed in the sea. Now that's good, but ultimately representing judgment. Or Job and his friends speak of the sea with dread and worry. Or, or likewise, in the book of Psalms, it refers to the sea in a way that it's often feared, where, where the Lord's strength is shown in his power over the sea. And so when you look at all these Old Testament examples, so often there's this sense of foreboding fear of the sea, that it's got this capacity to harm, that it's even a source of suffering and pain. I once had a summer job driving boats in the Penobscot Bay in Maine, and I spent a lot of time in the water. I even got lost in the fog once or twice. And, and I, I could say the ocean could be creepy. It sometimes can just make your sandwich really soggy, uh, but it could wear away your skin if you have to do the same repetitive movement over and over again. Uh, It's a transporter of things that can hurt you, like jellyfish and shark, and and it will beat you against the rocks without mercy. It can even kill you. And so back then, and and even more so, the sea was this undulating threat that they had no control over. And in the Bible, the sea is sometimes used to represent an undulating mass of sin and darkness. In Isaiah 57.20, it says that the wicked are like the tossing sea. In Revelation 13, the beast emerges from the sea. And so the sea reflects this teeming threat of sin and judgment. And here we see that in this new heaven and new earth, 
This threat, it'll be gone. And then in verse 2, John now changes our focus to what comes out of this new heaven and earth. And so verse 2 says, And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And so within this new heaven and earth is a new hub of life, made ready as in decorated as a bride would be for her husband. A wedding ceremony celebrates the hopeful, joyful union of a man and a woman. Countless millions of brides throughout history have prepared themselves for their wedding day when they will finally give their hand to their husband, and that's what's going on here. John is showing us that the marriage supper that we read about in Revelation 19 has now brought us here to this union where God and his people will dwell together as a family. This is the declaration of verse 3. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne, which is basically saying this is the Lord himself saying these things. And this voice was saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And so now we're seeing that in this new Jerusalem, there won't be any separation between God and man because of sin any longer. Throughout history and even now, when God dwells with his people, it's always been veiled. We do not see him. We don't hear him. We serve him in faith through a veil. But here in this new Jerusalem, God and man will dwell together and they will enjoy sweet, joyful togetherness that's not unlike the joyful love and hope of a newly married husband and wife. Not only that, but verse 4 says, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, which then reminds us that's exactly what Isaiah 65 said. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And so this union we're seeing here produces joy, not sorrow, no pain, no fear, Those kinds of things, they were the result of Adam's pursuit of knowing both good and evil. And these people in this new Jerusalem, they don't want to pursue evil, and they won't pursue evil. And so the results of evil won't be a part of their existence. But since the old existence was cursed by God, in verse 5, the Lord says, Behold, I'm making all things new. The world and this world's ways are so corrupted by sin that God will just simply start over, and he makes everything new. And this is so certain. God tells John, Write these things down, or or just write, write these things down, for these words are faithful and true. Basically, you can rely upon them and take them to the bank. In verse 6, the Lord reminds us that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is outside of time and able to make these things come to pass, and he will give to anyone who is thirsty for this, for forgiveness and transformation to holiness. He will he will open the doors of this kingdom to them. They are the people in verse 7 who overcome their sins, whom he will call this incredible, this incredible title here. He will call his sons. Now, that's an incredible statement, to be called the sons of God or children of God. But notice who's not going to be there. Verse 8 says, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, uh, he's just saying this is this not an exhaustive list here, just representing the kinds of things that won't be in this new Jerusalem. Their part, it goes on to say, will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so these people won't be in this new Jerusalem. The cowardly won't be there. Now, this is not talking about a person who just like jumps when you go, boo. <laughs> you know, this is talking about a person who is so fearful of others that they really give the power and control of their life to people rather than the Lord. And their cowardice just shows they're not trusting God, not walking with them. They're not of God. Obviously, also we see in this verse here, unbelievers, people who don't believe in the Lord won't be there. Plus those who are immoral and, and who flagrantly violate God's moral laws. Likewise, there won't be anyone there who follows any other god or any kind of sorcery. None of these people will be there because they've all already been cast in the lake of fire. And we saw that yesterday at the end of Revelation 20. Okay, so we're working through Revelation 21 here. And up to this point, we've taken a fairly straightforward approach to this chapter. But now things are going to take a slightly more symbolic turn. And so in verse 9, an angel takes John to the bride, the wife of the lamb. And this makes something clear that we've already gotten a hint of. And that's that the groom of the bride is the lamb. Now, the term lamb occurs in verses 14, 22, 23, 27, then also in chapter 22, verses 1 and 3. Who is this lamb? The lamb, of course, is our Lord and Savior, our God and our King, Jesus Christ. And so this next section is where John meets the bride of this lamb. Now, we might think that if John was going to meet a bride, he'd be going to meet a person. But that's not who the angel takes John to see. In verse 10, it says, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And so John is carried to this great and high mountain so that he can have this incredible view of this holy city, and this city turns out to be the bride of the Lamb. 
And when John says that this new Jerusalem is coming out of heaven, this is not a new descent, but rather the same vision as back in verse 2, but now John is giving us more details about this city. And so what are the details that John gives to us? Well, he goes into giving us various kinds of building materials and dimensions. For one thing, in verse 11, he says this new Jerusalem shines with the glory of God. Now, right now, in our own existence right now, because of sin and the curse, things of our existence don't have glory in themselves. But in the new Jerusalem, everything will radiate with God's glory. And this shining glory radiates so much that John describes this city in verse 11 as saying, her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. We'll come back to these building materials and these jewels in just a moment. Going on, Verses 12 to 14 speak of a high wall with 12 gates with 12 angels who bore the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Leading up to the city are 12 foundational stones with the names of the 12 apostles. And this is just an incredible picture here because the 12 gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 stones are named after the apostles. All of this shows us the unity as well as the distinction between Israel and the church. The church does not replace Israel, nor is she the sole bride of the Lamb. Together, this bride is comprised of believing Jews and believing Gentiles, together as one people with the Lord. Well, in verses 15 to 17, an angel then measures the city with a golden rod and shows us that this city is enormous. Specifically, it's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Now, if these are literal dimensions, it's a huge city. But perhaps even more to the point is the shape. If its length and breadth and width and height are all equal... Well, then this is a cube, and to John's Jewish leaders, they would have understood in the Old Testament, the only place you have dimensions that create a cube are in the temple and the tabernacle. What part of them was the cube? Well, the holiest of holies, the place where God dwells. And so the point of these measurements seems to be really showing us that the bride of God is the place where God dwells in glory. And so these measurements are really just giving us greater detail going back to verse 3, where the Lord himself said, The tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And so this entire city is devoted to God, dedicated to God, and dwelt by God. Every inch of every foot of every mile is filled with God and for God and to his glory. But something else we miss here, especially in our English translations, the New American translation especially, is that when they put these measurements in the miles, we miss what the Greek is saying. In the Greek, it's not 1,500 miles, it's 12,000 stadia. And so the length doesn't seem to be as important as the number 12. These edges are not 1,500 miles, but rather 12,000 stadia. And a cube has 12 edges, and so 12,000 stadia multiplied by 12 edges is 144,000. Now that's a number that is highly debated, but clearly important in the book of Revelation. Now for time's sake, I'm just going to hit the next few verses quickly. Verses 18 to 21 describe the materials of this city in terms of beautiful gemstones. Now, many people will seek to find figurative or symbolic meaning in these stones. Sometimes it's linked to the stones that were in the breastplate that the high priest would wear, or perhaps more likely the high priest's breastplate had these stones in it to reflect the radiant beauty and the glory of this holy city that was indwelt by God. Now, going on to verse 22, let's talk about what's missing here in heaven. Verse 22 tells us, There is no temple because the Lord God and the Lamb are its temple. And since this entire city is indwelt by God, we will be worshiping Him directly in every place, just direct worship of our Lord. In verse 23, There is no sun or moon because the glory of God and the light of the Lamb illumines it. And that brings us all the way back to day one of creation when God created light on day one before the fourth day when He created the sun and the moon. And that's because God himself radiates light and the radiance of the sun and moon simply reflect his own radiance. Going on, verse 25, There is no closure of its gates because there is no night, no darkness, no danger. This new Jerusalem will always be safe. And in verse 27, There is nothing unclean. There is no lying in this city. The only ones who will ever enter this city in verse 21, it says, are those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We talked about that yesterday. And so this city is a place whose citizens are not only clothed in Christ's righteousness, they are made righteous in Christ, and therefore they will never be able to sin. There will be no disobedience in this new Jerusalem. Well, that's Revelation 21. Hopefully this quick run-through shows us that although Revelation 21 is rich with meaning, it is not filled with hidden meaning that would otherwise make no sense to John's readers. The things that John shows us are the finalized fulfillment of all of the promises that God's people have been looking forward to since time began. 
So with that, thanks for listening. I look forward to this year's final podcast tomorrow with you as we go through Revelation chapter 22. And until then, have a great rest of your day. God bless. God bless.